All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the UW Taiwan Studies Program event, Special Roundtable, Making Waves, Taiwan's Presidential Elections 2024. My name is James Lin. I am an Assistant Professor of International Studies in the Jackson School, as well as Associate Chair for the Taiwan Studies Program. Tonight, we have a, a very special event that we get to hold every four years, no sooner, no later, on a momentous occasion for Taiwan and its democracy which is the presidential and legislative elections. We have three special speakers this evening who will discuss the elections from different perspectives, from domestic electoral politics to the international and foreign policy implications of the elections. And finally, from media studies, looking at how uh, Taiwan's political elections are portrayed in and also affected by the new hit Taiwanese uh, drama, Wave Makers, which we derived the title of our program from tonight. Uh, what I'll do is I'll first introduce our speakers. I'll uh, give a brief overview of our format, and then I will get out of the way and let our experts speak. So first, we will have Dr. Karis Templeman, research fellow at the Hoover Institution and uh, one of the directors behind the project on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific region, as well as lecturer at the Center for East Asian Studies at Stanford. Dr. Templeman holds a BA from University of Rochester, a PhD in political science from University of Michigan, and he writes and speaks frequently about cross-strait relations and Taiwan politics and policy issues. He's edited three volumes, Taiwan's Democracy Challenge, the Tsun Shui-bian Years, Dynamics of Democracy in Taiwan, the Ma Yingzhou Years, and Electoral Malpractice in Asia, Bending the Rules. He's written a number of articles on uh, Taiwan policy issues for the Brookings Institution, Atlantic Council, Foreign Affairs, Taiwan Insight, War in the Rocks, and The Diplomat. After cars, we'll hear from Dr. David Bachman, professor at the Jackson School of International Studies and currently serving as associate director of the Jackson School. Uh, for many years, he was chair of the China Studies program, continues to be an integral faculty member for both China Studies and Taiwan Studies. Uh, Dr. Bachman's research focuses on Chinese domestic and foreign policy, international political economy, Asian politics, international relations, and US-China relations. Finally, last but not least, we have Ellen Zhang, who's our director of the Arts and Culture Program at the University of Washington Taiwan Studies Program. Uh, she's also a PhD candidate in cinema and media studies. As both a film scholar and an art curator slash practitioner, her research examines the transac transactional encounter among contemporary Taiwanese video art installation, cinema, and popular culture as processes of aesthetic decolonization. Her recent work on sound and audio box explores more engaged, sensitive, and practical understandings of how audiovisual art reflects reoccurring themes of everyday politics across international geographies. The format for our roundtable tonight, each of our speakers will have 10 minutes to present on a particular aspect of the elections, after that, I will ask each of our speakers one question, and we'll have a, a brief group discussion. And then I will open it up to all of you for Q&A from the audience. So uh, I won't hold this up any longer. Let's go ahead and give a round of applause to welcome our three panelists. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here this evening with you all, uh, and I. I'm delighted. I want to thank uh, the organizers for the invitation to speak because I'm delighted to speak with you about my favorite topic of all time, Taiwan elections. Um, so given that I only have 10 minutes, I'm going to jump right in. Um, presumably, all of you in the room know that Taiwan is going to have presidential and legislative elections on January 13th, 2024. That's less than three months away now. Um, and uh, the current incumbent president, Tsai Ing-wen, is term limited out of office. So we're going to have a new president in Taiwan in 2024. Uh, she has been the incumbent for two terms. Her ruling party, the DPP, has held the majority in the legislature for two terms. So this uh, election will decide who governs Taiwan for the next four years. Um, and the key takeaway, if you get nothing else from what I have to, uh, am about to say, is that we don't actually know who's going to win this election yet. Um, there's some conventional wisdom, and I often speak to people in Washington, D.C. or further afield about Taiwan politics, and the conventional wisdom there seems to be that the DPP is going to win this election, that William Lai, the vice president right now, the nominee of the DPP, uh, is leading clearly in the polls, and he's a shoe in um, I think it's too early to say that. 
because Lai and the DPP are actually not very popular right now. Um, they're uh, coming out of two terms in office. There's a lot of just kind of disillusioned or disgruntled voters who voted for them last time and who are looking for an alternative out there. Uh, and more importantly, we still don't know who the uh, opposition candidate or candidates uh, will be and uh, whether they will cooperate. Uh, so right now there are actually four declared candidates uh, for the presidency. It's not clear that they will all be on the ballot on January 13th. Uh, so let me get into that a little bit. Here's the campaign for president for 2024. Um, on the uh, kind of China skeptical left of the political spectrum in Taiwan, the green side uh, in Taiwan political parlance, uh, we have uh, the DPP's William Lai, who's the current vice president. Uh, on the uh, kind of China friendly blue end of the spectrum, we have the KMT's Ho Yi, uh, who is the current uh, mayor of New Taipei, uh, was re-elected overwhelmingly last fall, um, and uh, has a background as a policeman, actually, came up through the police ranks before he became uh, deputy mayor and then mayor of uh, New Taipei. Uh, and in the middle of the political spectrum, we have the former mayor of uh, Taipei, Ke Wenjia, who, uh, in addition to being uh, trying to position himself between these two parties, also founded a new party called the Taiwan People's Party, or TPP. Now, if you study, study international political economy, TPP kind of connotes a very different thing. Um, so it's kind of confusing in English, but in, in the Chinese, it's Min Zhongdang, so the Taiwan People's Party. Um, and uh, Mayor Ke is... Uh, a little bit unusual as a candidate, well, for many reasons, but uh, one is that he started out firmly in the green camp. So he was endorsed by the DPP when he first ran for office in 2014. Uh, over his two terms as Taipei mayor, he kind of drifted towards the center, uh, and now he's flirting with cooperating with the KMT camp uh, in the general election. And so he's uh, in choosing the color of his new political party, in fact, he chose one that is neither blue nor green, it's aquamarine, so it's right in the middle. Um, oh, why is this guy up here? I, I can't get rid of it. Okay, I have to talk about it. Um, all right, there is a fourth candidate who has declared he's running for office, and it's Terry Guo, who is the uh, founder and former chairman of Foxconn, the company that makes your iPhones in mainland China. Um, he uh, wanted the KMT nomination, sought it, didn't get it, rage quit the party, uh, and then declared he was going to run as an independent. Uh, and under Taiwan electoral law, he has to go out and gather 300,000 signatures in 45 days to qualify for the ballot. He just turned those signatures in yesterday, uh, at least he said he did. Um, and so the Electoral Commission will decide in a, a few days whether he has actually crossed the threshold to run. Um, I don't want to talk about him too much more in this uh, presentation, in part because uh, his peak in the polls was the day he declared he was going to run, uh, and he's been pretty consistently downward ever since. So I think he's almost, if not entirely, irrelevant to this conversation at this point. All right. Um, issues in the presidential campaign. Well, uh, the first and foremost is always cross-strait relations. How would the candidates handle relations with Beijing? Um, and I, I'll just note something for this audience. There's a little bit of a different dynamic this time around on cross-strait relations than in 2016 or 2020 when Beijing uh, was clearly this kind of uh, threat and didn't want the DPP to win. Uh, and voters really stuck it to Beijing by supporting the DPP and Tsai Ing-wen. Uh, this time around, I've been struck by this kind of sense of unease among the Taiwan electorate that uh, you know, the person who is elected this time around may be in office when there's a military conflict with China, right? So some of this is being reinforced by rhetoric coming out of the U.S. that says Xi Jinping has set a deadline of 2027 to reunite Taiwan with the mainland. Well, 2027 is within the term of the next president, the first term. Uh, and so the KMT is kind of leaning into this message that a vote for the DPP, so another four years of DPP rule would be disastrous for cross-strait relations, vote for us and we'll keep the peace. Uh, and my sense is that that's actually having a bit more traction in the electorate this time around than it has over the last two uh, electoral cycles. Um, also reinforcing this message is the fact that the PRC has really stepped up its uh, military activities around Taiwan. They're deliberately and uh, quite uh, 
quite ostentatiously uh, entering Taiwan's ADIS, crossing the median line with aircraft and ships. Uh, and they're trying to make a point that a vote for the DPP is a, a vote for a lot of problems. And if you vote against the DPP, cross-strait relations will be stabilized. Um, second issue, this doesn't get as much attention in the international press, but Taiwan has some major economic challenges right now. Uh, the big one is that young people get paid very little. Um, the minimum wage is roughly, uh, these people are protesting to raise it up to 28,000 uh, NT a month. That's less than $1,000 US a month. Um, and uh, like most countries in the world, Taiwan has been affected by the inflationary pressures of the Ukraine war um, and the kind of post-pandemic supply chain uh, crunches as well. And so there's some latent unhappiness with the DPP's management of the economy in Taiwan. Uh, also, if we just look at quarterly growth in Taiwan, Taiwan is actually technically in a recession for two quarters. They're coming out of it. But this is not a great place to be if you are the ruling party asking voters to give you a third term in office. Right. Um, uh, finally, th this isn't really an issue so much as uh, a couple of variables I would encourage everybody to pay attention to here. If you've followed Taiwan politics casually over the years, you've probably heard the term blue north, green south. And so geography is emphasized as a variable that drives voting behavior. I don't think geography matters at much in this election. At least it's not going to drive uh, the swing voters to swing in one way or another. And neither does national identity. I think the national identity uh, uh, variable as a predictor of vote behavior, at least for swing voters, uh, is played out. Uh, and I would encourage you to look at two other things that are really coming out strongly in the polling data uh, in this election. The first is age. Young people really like Ke Wenjia. They don't like either of the two mainstream candidates. They really like Ke. Um, and old people don't. Uh, I'll show you some data. Apologize, I don't have this in English here, but this is uh, data taken from a TVBS poll. Um, it shows uh, Ke Wenja is the, the kind of highlighted uh, box there. It shows him polling over 50% in the 20 to 29 age group. And he's polling at five or 6% in the 60 and over age group, right? So this is a huge delta, huge gap between young people and old people in terms of support for Ke. Uh, and in fact, there's a kind of monotonic decline uh, in each 10-year increment uh, across age groups. Um, so Ke is much better among the younger people, much worse among the older. Um, the second variable here is gender. Um, Taiwan, as we'll hear later in the panel, had a, a Me Too scandal that reverberated through Taiwan politics for several months, uh, also kind of gave the DPP, the ruling party, a black eye. Uh, Ko Wenja turns out to be much more popular among men than women. Uh, and so if you look, this is a different survey company. Um, I'm going to show more data from this in a moment. But um, Ko Wenja actually is polling about 10 points better among men than women. Uh, and in fact, this may surprise some people in the room, uh, the KMT is doing the best among female voters. Uh, they're doing better among female voters than the other two candidates. Right? Um, uh, so my Formosa is, uh, in my view, probably the best, most consistent, most transparent polling company in Taiwan. And so if you want one company's polls to pay attention to, I would recommend them. They put all their data up online. You can download it. If you can read Chinese, at least, you can have access to it. Um, and uh, what they show is a pretty stable race uh, from July all the way until now. So Lai Qingde, the green line here, is clearly in the lead but he's not close to 50%. Uh, and the two main opposition candidates are neck and neck. Sometimes one is ahead, sometimes the other is behind and so forth. Um, but the big takeaway here, and the reason that we don't know who's gonna actually be on the ballot on January 13th, is that if you add up the two opposition candidates support in the polls, they're clearly above where William Lai is. Uh, and so the the strategic logic here is for those two to cooperate and only nominate one candidate. Uh, so coordinate or die is the message of this month. Uh, they have until November 24th to register. So we will know in about three weeks whether the KMT and TPP do manage to coordinate on a single candidate or not. And that, I think, is going to be pretty decisive for how this race shakes out. Um, 
the re one of the reasons to coordinate is that Ku is really strong among young voters uh, and educated voters. Ho is stronger among older deep blue voters and women. And so they complement each other. If they're able to combine their core supporters uh, behind one ticket, they have a good chance of winning, I think. Um, the big problem, number one, is who's on top, right? Uh, uh, the KMT insists they're the long time, uh, you know, they're the kind of national founding party. They're the, the, it's almost unthinkable for them not to nominate a presidential candidate in this race and to endorse somebody else. Um, Ku makes a, a pretty strong argument, I think, that young voters are not going to follow him and support the KMT ticket if he's not at the top of that ticket. And if he's in the VP slot, the VP position is quite weak. Um, he may be, be viewed as a sellout from some of his core supporters, and so they may just abandon him. And so they've got a dilemma there. Um, the second part of this negotiation is what does the guy who's not on top get? Uh, and in the TPP's case, they have some opportunity to uh, expand their seat share in the legislature and potentially hold the balance of power in the legislature. And so if there's a concession or two that the KMT can make that ensures the TPP is the kind of coalition partner in the legislature, uh, I actually think the TPP might go for that. Um, let me say a little bit then about the legislative elections. Taiwan is going to hold the legislative elections the same day, uh, at the same time, and there's three electoral tiers up uh, for grabs. Um, there's 73 seats in single member districts, so about two thirds are elected from single member districts. The DPP won, that's a typo, it should say 46 seats in 2020. Um, there's a second tier of 34 seats that are elected via closeness closed list PR. TPP won only 13 of those, and so did the KMT. So in the PR, the parties were neck and neck. Uh, and then, then there's this indigenous tier in which the DPP won two. Um, the conventional wisdom right now is that the DPP is not going to be able to hold on to their majority. They uh, won a significant number of the district seats by uh, less than 5%. I think the number is uh, it's at least 12 uh, that they won by a margin of less than 5%. And so if their, if their overall vote share goes down further, they're likely to lose a lot of these district seats, either to the KMT or to someone else. Um, and so they're trying to hang on to their majority. And uh, if you read the pundits in Taiwan, they, they expect the DPP will lose that majority. Um, that prognostication is complicated by the fact that there are small parties running third-party candidacies in a lot of these districts. And uh, to my mind, there's something new happening here, which is the DPP is not actually doing a good job of coordinating on single candidates in each district. Tsai Ing-wen, when she was head of the DPP, was masterful at keeping people who didn't get the nomination from running as renegade candidates. She kept them on board and inside the party. Now, Lai Qingda is the chair of the party. And uh, to this point, it looks like he's doing a much worse job than she did about preventing defections from the DPP. So there's five or six districts where there's a DPP candidate running as a renegade. They didn't get the nomination. They're running anyway, and they're probably going to split the green vote. Um, so let me wrap up here. Scenarios for 2024. I think there's nothing else you take away from this. I think there's a lot of uncertainty still, and we probably won't even know who the candidates are. Uh, for sure, until November 24th, which is the deadline to register. Uh, and unlike in, uh, say, Korea, you can't withdraw a week before the election. Um, as soon as November 24th deadline is set, uh, as soon as the candidates register, they're there through election day, and so unless one of them dies. That's the only exception. Um, so I think the most likely possibility here is that Ko, Ko and Ho do cooperate in the end, uh, and that the presidential election is close, um, and that no party wins a majority in the LY. So that, to me, is the most likely outcome here. I think the second most likely outcome is that H K and Ho don't cooperate. Lai wins pretty easily, uh, but with a plurality, not a majority, and no party controls a majority in the LY. The TPP is probably in a kingmaker role, where they control the balance of power in the legislature. And third, Ke and Ho don't cooperate, Lai wins, and somehow the DPP holds on to their majority in the legislature, at the, probably uh, because the TPP increases their seats at the expense of the KMT and people are really abandoning the KMT in this election. Um, so with that, uh, I'll stop there. Uh, I hope that wasn't too fast, too much, uh, but 
Um, I'm really interested to hear David's analysis of uh, what these different scenarios might mean for U.S., China, and Taiwan relations. Uh, the talk I'm about to give, I'm sure Karis could have made as easily as he made that last uh, presentation and do it better, but you're going to get my take anyway. Um, so, so I would argue that for the first time in a long time, uh, the outcome of Taiwan's elections, particularly the presidential election, will have limited outcomes on Taiwan-China, Taiwan-US, and Taiwan-Asian relations. The reason for that is that in most parts of the world, policy debates about Taiwan don't weigh, don't weigh the specific domestic politics of Taiwan all that heavily in their discussions these days. Moreover, my reading of the position of the candidates suggests that they have their differences in emphasis, uh, but they're not hugely different either, at least when it comes to what they say in the US and what they say about China. So all four candidates for the presidency of the ROC have been in the US in the last six months, with three of them, William Lai Qingde, Ho Yo Yi, and Ko Wenzhe, coming with the deliberate intent of reassuring the US that if elected, they would not act, they would not unilaterally uh, alter the status quo. Lai and Ho, uh, as the candidates of the two largest parties, received the most attention. And because Lai is also vice president of the ROC and because of the US's one China policy, his meeting with US government officials were not widely publicized. Nonetheless, sources reported that the US was reassured by what Lai said behind closed doors, uh, reflecting perhaps a more moderate tone than he sometimes took on the stump in Taiwan, where he uh, sort of pushed the envelope to hear, to, to appeal to uh, deep green voters. Ho was involved in more public events uh, and, and published an essay in the Council on Foreign Relations Foreign Affairs website, uh, where he again reassured the US that the KMT he led was different than mine, Joe's KMT. Uh, strong national defense came across in that essay as his highest priority. Again, at least when speaking to US audiences, though he, he did say he would start try to restart dialogue with the PRC. Uh, perhaps because he was perceived as a third party candidate in the US political system that doesn't see third party candidates as all that important, received less attention. And he didn't go to Washington. He mainly went to Silicon Valley and to Stanford where he met with Karis and he can give us the inside scoop about that. <laughs> Uh, and Terry Go Taiming uh, traveled to the U.S. in July uh, before he declared his presidency, and Go's position are perhaps the least clear of the four. While that's happening, official Washington was indeed reassured by the visits of Lai and Ho. Uh, but almost irrespective of the Taiwan presidential elections, there is a raging debate in the U.S. about what U.S.-Taiwan policy should be going forward. On the one hand are those who see the value in continuing U.S.-Taiwan policy as it has been practiced since the Carter administration. No official relations, maintain the one China policy, strengthen Taiwan's defense capabilities, but do not try to mediate Taiwan-China relations and do not preclude a peaceful settlement of the Taiwan issue uh, by China and Taiwan themselves. In the view of some in this camp, the point is to keep the PRC thinking that unif unification can still come about in the future peacefully. And the US should not do anything that prevents this possibility. In the stark words of one advocate of this position, a colleague of Karis's at Stanford, but if a pathway remains for China to eventually convince Taiwan's people through indu inducements or pressure that it is in their interest to peacefully unify then that may be a China we can live with. So short of actual use of force, Taiwan, can, uh, the PRC is basically bit given a, a blank check to use all kinds of pressure against Taiwan to force it to negotiate, which in legal terms is not a fair negotiation. Opposed to this view is one held by a number of people in the Republican party and some national security hawks who see a Chinese attack on Taiwan as imminent and who argue that deterrence of a Chinese attack is about to fail if it hasn't failed already. 
Their recommendation is for the United States to extend an explicit security guarantee, if not a formal military alliance to Taiwan. The mainstream view counters this by arguing that if, if we do, if the US does extend a security guarantee to Taiwan or an alliance, uh, this would provoke a PRC military attack. Uh, it, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy in some ways that you would uh, do this action that only brings about the outcome you want to avoid. The Biden administration is, is likely to continue with the mainstream approach, though it faces this opposition. Uh, and PRC efforts to coerce Taiwan into unification are only, only likely to strengthen the coalition that supports US upgrading relations with Taiwan. Uh, and we, of course, are having our own election in a year and, uh, and a week, I guess. Uh, and that, too, will have some bearing on how this plays out. On the PRC side, it seems clear that the Chinese Communist Party has come to view the Democratic, the, uh, the Democratic People, uh, uh, Democratic Progressive Party as unpatriotic, or, or put less neutrally, as traitors to the Chinese nation. It will simply not deal with the DPP uh, unless the DPP accepts the 1992 consensus as a living document and guides the DPP's policy towards China. Xi Jinping continues to see one country, two systems as the way ahead for a peaceful outcome, but developments in Hong Kong since 2019 suggest that few in Taiwan would take this seriously. More basically, Xi's China dream of national rejuvenation cannot be achieved without Taiwan being incorporated into the PRC. Xi's peaceful unification offer amounts to surrender, uh, which few in Taiwan would be likely to accept. As she said in a speech to the 20th Party Congress last year, quote, we will never promise to renounce the use of force and we will reserve the option of taking all necessary measures. This is directed solely at interference by outside forces and the few separatists seeking Taiwan independence and their separatist activities. It is by no means targeted at Taiwan compatriots. In other words, anyone who wants an independent Taiwan is not a Taiwan compatriot. Again, they're a traitor uh, and they will be punished as were the Democrats in Hong Kong. Presumably, uh, the CCP is more likely to favor the KMT than DPP or TPP uh, because of its experience with Ma ying Zhou and Ho's willingness, as he says, to engage in dialogue. How it feels about Go is unclear. Go would presumably be the candidate with the greatest interest in smooth PRC-Taiwan relations. But recently, the PRC carried out tax inspections of Foxconn's China factories. This might partially be aimed at Apple because of the, in response to the sanctions that President Biden recently released uh, on Chinese, on high-tech sales to China. But it may also be aimed at Go trying to force him back to back out of the campaign and support Ho. So what about the rest of Asia? So we've seen the United, Sta United States broker arrangements with Japan and South Korea that seem to speak to more common security interests, that we've seen the creation of Australia, US, and, uh, and, and UK kind of relations, strengthen US military presence in the Philippines and an upgrading of our military relations, at least under uh, President Marcos. Uh, and so all of these speak to a growing sense of building a security community across both uh, e uh, East Asia and Southeast Asia and into Oceania, of which the point of this would be presumably to serve as a deterrent to China altering the status quo. That said, Japan, South Korea, Australia, Philippines are not exactly being explicit about what they would do in the case of a Chinese attack on Taiwan. That uh, those countries uh, do an extraordinarily high level of trade with the PRC. They're not anxious to be all that explicit about what they would do in the event of a Chinese attack. Given Chinese military planning, that were China to attack 
uh, Taiwan, U.S. bases in Okinawa and perhaps other U.S. bases in Japan would be uh, objects of attack, which probably means that the Japanese understand this, uh, are anxious to deter such an attack, uh, but don't want to take the lead about doing that. So I think there's a fair amount of quiet talk to the U.S. Uh, by U.S. allies in the region that they will support the U.S. trying to deter the PRC, but they're not going to be upfront about it. They're not going to make this a central uh, portion of their foreign policy. Rather, they will <coughs> phrase it in ways that suggest their own national security is what they're protecting, even if they're increasingly seeing that national security as collective rather than individual. And with that, I will stop. Thank you. So um, when we think about what David and Karis just talk about, it seems like moving forward discussion, at least from the part that I will be covering, resemble a page six column um, in certain aspects. <laughs> but I guess it's not entirely inappropriate given that Taiwan's elections have historically carried in a, an air of drama and theatrics. There's often a presence of celebrities um, or um, those on the cusp of stardom, which only adds to the spectacle, right? Um, so before I delve into um, the connection between these elections and the Netflix hit Wave Makers, let me provide a very brief introduction to the show. But rest assured, I will keep it to a minimum in case it's still on your Netflix watch list. Um, so Wave Makers is a 2023 um, Taiwanese political drama series created by Jin Lin and also um, Yan uh, Shiji and directed by Lin, Junxiang, uh, Lin Junyang, a name well known to those who follow recent Taiwanese dramas, such as The World Between Us, Go Leave, and Eye of the Storm. Um, Wave Makers made its debut on Netflix on April 28th, 2023 this year, um, and went on winning this year's Golden Bell Awards for Best Miniseries and Best Directing for a Miniseries, among other technical awards. This series is currently airing, so it's just aired um, a couple of days ago in Taiwan's public television service um, since October 28, 2023. Um, wave makers hold a significant um, and in some ways tricky um, role in the upcoming presidential election. Its portrayal of the lives of political campaign staff from a fictional Taiwanese party in the lead up to a presidential race resonates strongly um, with the impending election. However, as we know, Taiwan's elections are often likened to a theatrical show, and um, it would be overly simplistic to assume that the connection ends there. Um, but well, actually it did kind of very briefly um, after a moment when the show brought immediate attention to the issue of sexual harassment in Taiwanese society. A former party staffer from the Taiwan's Democratic Party, uh, Progressive Party was prompt to share her experience of harassment at the workplace on social media, revealing that her supervisor discouraged her from pursuing the matter she referenced a piv um, pivotal line from Wavemakers in her post where Ong Wenfang um, and Zhang Yajing, um, who is shown on this picture, um, Ong Wenfang told Zhang Yajing that that's not just forget about what happened, okay? So following the Democratic Political Party's prompt response, Taiwan's long-awaited Me Too movement quickly transitioned from the political sphere to the arts and culture circles. Um, at that moment, voters might believe that this marks the end um, of Wavemaker's influence on the election. But in a surprising move, independent candidate Guo Taiming announced on September 14 that his running mate for the upcoming election would be Lai Peixia, who is on screen right now, um, who portrayed a victorious presidential candidate of the Justice Party in Wavemaker. This could be dismissed as a um, mere coincidence, but pro perhaps not so much from um, Guo Taiming's perspective. After all, um, Lai Peixia was chosen for the role of Lin Ruizhen in Wavemaker due to her uncanny resemblance to the persona of a presidential candidate the production team sought to convey on screen. Her speech at the press conference echoed Lin Ruizhen's addresses in the show further blurring that line between reality and also uh, fiction, which sparks a public debate actually on PB PTS airing schedule um, of this show because it's just simply too sensitive. Um, and that debate is available on YouTube if any of you is interested in watching it. This series has not only captured the attention of viewer, but also sparked intriguing discussion about how it intersects with the actual political climate in Taiwan. 
The show delves into various critical domestic issues, such as environmental concerns, the death penalty, immigration, same-sex marriage, and workplace sexual harassment. However, it makes the most significant impact by catalyzing the long-awaited Me Too movement in Taiwan. While the movement quickly transcends the political arena, its aftermath, coupled with the series' focal point on women, offers voters and competing parties a unique perspective to assess the presidential election in real terms. The effectiveness of this impact is evident in how swiftly the DPP responded to the allegations against its member. Taiwan's president, Taiwan's president Tsai Ing-wen not only issued one, but two apologies and pledged substantive changes in party policies and culture. The DPP took every measure at that moment um, to mitigate the damage and safeguard their connection with the young voters demographic, a crucial group in their voter base. Though not explicitly part of this Me Too movement, wave makers have certainly shifted how media and voters scrutinize candidates. Previously, Taiwan's elections often revolve around scandals such as plagiarism, like thesis plagiarism, all kinds of those, and um, political finance. However, the Me Too movement in Taiwan addressing issues like the cultural euphemism of chi dofu, eating tofu, uh, for sexual exploitation, has amplified a focus on gender-related concerns. This, um, the Taiwan People's Party and its candidate Ke Wen-je has faced intense scrutiny um, as indicated by the polls. And Guo Taiming, I know Karis doesn't really want to talk about him much, but as I'm doing this column six talk here, he has to be here. Um, so he entered the fray, creating videos of Taiwanese internet celebrities from, this, from his overturned Taiwan campaign, presumably targeting younger voters, especially um, those on TikTok. The video parody a popular TikTok song um, while some found it amusing, many um, thought it was unfit for a presidential candidate due to its lyrics and also Guo's symbolic table flip gesture representing change in Taiwan and its association with TikTok. The clips was like promptly moved, um, removed in response to a very widespread criticism. So presidential candidates are frequently featured in reaction videos by YouTubers and on podcasts. Bloomberg's candidate interviews prompt responses from YouTuber Lai Min Di World News, who critique both Bloomberg's production and also the candidate's pre uh, performance in those interview. For YouTubers like Min Di and international outlets like Bloomberg, the main concern is how the Taiwanese election and also its candidates are portrayed globally. The same applies to Netflix, though with a very different approach. Right, The interview and YouTuber's reaction largely center on each candidate's stances and policies concerning international relations, especially Taiwan's relationship with the PRC. This aspect is notably absent in Wavemakers. Um, the political campaign depicted in Wavemaker unfolds in a world where China isn't part of the narrative at all. Um, instead, for this entertainment platform, the emphasis is firmly on Taiwan as a thriving democracy, highlighting how its citizen can exercise their rights to vote freely. Um, this theme offers a more accessible and also engaging narrative that centers on universal issues. In the media electoral, um, electoral interplay, both new and traditional medias have pivotal roles. While platforms like YouTube and Netflix significantly influence younger voters, we shouldn't dismiss um, the impact of television, newspapers, and even telephone communications, the original the OG form of social media, right? Um, so imagine a living room where news channels and political commentary shows run nonstop for 24 hours. This site is common among older Taiwanese households and can be seen almost as a traditional form of reaction videos as they respond to events evolving candidates in almost synchronous manner. The ongoing debate on this pan blue camp unity described as a matchmaking process triggers responses across various media platforms. And while younger voters critique traditional media's framing, they also grapple with echo chambers dominated by social media algorithms. Media's roles in elections is strikingly evident in the Pan Blue Party's collaboration approach. Even in polling, just by deciding how to poll, the choice of format mirrors the struggle between diverse media platforms for different voters' demographics. Deciding between landlines, cell phones, internets, or apps highlights how media and its technology influence modern candidates' campaign strategy. 
And this dynamics underscore how media intricately shaped the electoral landscape in Taiwan, and especially for this presidential um, election. So I think that's all for me. All right, thank you so much to Paris, David, and Ellen for their initial presentations. Um, I'm just gonna ask a series of questions. Uh, one question directed in particular to each presenter and then an open question. And I will leave it to our um, panelists to discuss however they would like to. And I encourage um, cross dialogue if you would so choose to do so. Um, the initial question I had for cars, I feel like you spent 10 minutes answering already. So <laughs> I, I might steal David's question and ask, you know, um, you, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but, you know, based on your kind of personal experiences, having met with some of the candidates, um, if you want to elaborate on any of that and, and share any insights. Um, for David, uh, you've also answered the question that I <laughs> wanted to ask. Um, and so I, I might ask you to elaborate maybe a little bit more about your, your very initial thesis that um, this might be one of the elections that we've had where the, the outcome of the election may matter the least. And I wonder from a historical perspective, if you think you know, the reasons for that are because we're we're in a moment of particularly tense U.S.-China relations. If that is kind of the defining factor for your initial kind of um, uh, starting point. Um, and Ellen, you've also already answered. <laughs> this is this isn't quite fair. Um, well, Ellen, I I I feel like the the kind of framework you've given us is really compelling to think about the influence of media on political culture. Um, so many of the things that you've raised, I, I think that we have thought about, but hasn't really entered into mainstream political science. The idea of, of theater in particular, how that is an important part. The, the performativity of politics is so important. Um, and then seeing the, the merging of that with, you know, like fiction meets, meets reality with the, the nomination of Tammy Lai. I, I don't know, this isn't really coherent. I wonder if you want to, to elaborate a little bit further about um, should we, we as social scientists think more interdisciplinarily about the importance of performativity and, and theatrics and um, the media landscape when we consider politics. So kind of a more of a meta question. Um, and then just a, a really general open question. You don't have to address this if you don't want to. This is just, um, Super broad question. Uh, what is unique about these 2024 elections? What do you think we might see that we haven't seen in the past? And you've already touched on this, so so don't feel compelled to answer. Um, but yeah, I'll I'll throw it out there and I'll I'll move to the side. So personal experience meeting with the candidates. Well, um, the only candidate we've actually hosted at Stanford, at least this election cycle, is uh, Coenja, who was there uh, just about a month ago, um, and we had a a couple closed door sessions with him uh because that was under that that was off the record I, I won't speak in very specific terms about what he said to respect confidentiality but um i just note a couple of things one is uh i he he has a tendency well he, he, he'll between his public and private persona there's not a huge difference um, and so what he says publicly is not much different from what he says privately. Um, and uh, it registered with me that for the first time why especially young people like that. They don't think he's BSing, right? He's not, uh, he's not just lunch. Well, he's not just saying whatever uh, kind of fits the situation. Um, and so that gave me a bit of an insight into to why he has such a following among the younger, uh, younger voting crowd. Um, and then... Uh, the reason I think it's more likely than not that the KMT and K come to some kind of coordination or cooperation agreement is uh, I actually believed him when he said he's pragmatic, rational, scientific. He takes emotion out of the equation. And uh, if I were in his shoes and, you know, I got a chance to, to be around him for a couple hours um, and I wanted to maximize my long-term influence in Taiwan politics, um, I would think in the back of my head that the KMT is never gonna yield the top of the ticket to me 
And so I need to pursue a second best strategy um, to maximize my influence. Um, probably not running as the VP. Um, if VP is kind of where careers go to die in Taiwan, <laughs> especially in your first term. Um, so it's a, it's a powerless position. And if Ke joins the ticket as VP, he's kind of giving up his, um, you know, his image as somebody who critiques both uh, the major parties. He's joined the blue camp. He's all in with them. And so I think that's actually probably a bad move strategically for him. And the best move is to try to maximize what the TPP can get in the legislature and see, um, see the KMT ticket win, but not be on that ticket and extract some promises ahead of time for how they will govern and be able then to, uh, to hold them to those promises because they control the critical seats in the legislature that would re be required to get anything through the legislature. So, um, so I got the sense he was, he was in the mood to negotiate and he is thinking seriously about a cooperation agreement. Now the devil's in the details and I don't know, you know, it was just announced this morning. They had a meeting, a secret meeting last night. They got moved to three different locations because people kept finding out about it. Um, and uh, there was no announcement after that meeting. In fact, Ko said, you know, if you don't have a more concrete proposal, we don't need to meet again. So uh, I think there's a kind of, they're, they're in a game of chicken. <laughs> and Ko is trying to extract as much as he can before he swerves. Um, but this could go right down to the wire. And at the end, they crash into each other and both are on the ballot uh, and they both lose. So uh, that's you know, kind of the interpretation I had from hearing him speak in, in both to our faculty and fellows and a separate session with students. The Students Act's very hard questions, by the way, and, and he was willing to take those questions um, without a pre-screening. And so I, I give him a lot of credit for being willing to engage with people uh, without any kind of pre-approved group of people in the room or any kind of set of questions that he wouldn't talk about. Um, yeah. Well, I, I made my argument about why I think the election matters the least in, in history, partly because in the past we have seen the United States express clear preferences uh, that in 2007, uh, for example, uh, Thomas Christensen, then Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia, made it clear that the, uh, the Bush administration had had enough of uh, Chen Shui-bian and by extension the DPP calling for a strong and moderate Taiwan and not seeing the DPP as, as moderate at the time. In 2012, when Tsai came to the United States, uh, Tsai Ing-wen came to the United States, there were doubts raised about whether she was going to be uh, too strident or too active in pushing a, a Taiwan agenda. So that Taiwan politicians have learned uh, and the US has, has also learned, I think, that uh, its influence on the elections is not trivial uh, and at the same time understands that it probably shouldn't play a role. Taiwan politicians understand that reassuring the United States is an important part of the game because they have this history that the U.S. can let it be known that they're not happy with or not convinced that this person is going to act in the best interest of Taiwan. So that that on that side, uh, Ho and and uh, and Lai have come and tried to do exactly that, reassure both sides. But I basically would agree with James's point that the United States-China relationship now is, uh, if not at rock bottom, is in a very poor place. Uh, that, uh, that a rhetoric of, of being opposed to China is one that has bipartisan support on Capitol Hill and in much of the administration. The question is whether, from the administration's point of view, of whether a bottom can be put on that rock bottom. Uh, and in that sense, uh, that, that Taiwan is an object of this discussion, it's not a subject of this discussion in some ways, that, that, that very little subjectivity, I think, for Taiwan is part of that. The same could be said about the PRC, that Xi Jinping has made up his mind that uh, the DPP is you know, unredeemable. Uh, and in that sense, uh, 
you have the KMT uh, that may be inclined to uh, to cut some deals, but I think he's misreading the, the current KMT if he does. Uh, and uh, where you are, even if it's for planning purposes, building up military capabilities so that the PRC could carry out various kinds of military actions to either coerce surrender by Taiwan or to militarily defeat Taiwan. So in that sense, again, I think they understand uh, or see, you know, who knows what, who's telling him what and how open they are and what they tell him, but that she knows that the U.S. is not going to allow Taiwan to declare independence, at least from the Taiwan side, the impetus for declaring itself to be a truly independent country. Uh, now, of course, the DPP says it already is an independent country, so it doesn't have to declare its independence. But this would be a, an independent Taiwan seeking international recognition uh, and a membership in major international institutions, organizations, where statehood is a requirement. Uh, that's not going to come from Taiwan. The PRC, I think, is pretty sure. It may come from effectively the U.S. extending a security guarantee or a treaty, which the PRC will see as formal relations with Taiwan as a state uh, that, uh, that really does challenge uh, the status quo. And I'll stop there. Um, so I think for from a media studies point of view or a cinema studies point of view, um election is all about full show, right? Obviously performativity, the theatricality, it's all about performance. And now with media technology coming in, like new media, these um short um TikTok videos, Instagram stories and everything. There, it got it becomes even more complicated because now it's not only about the performance, like which the candidates can take control of, like they can decide how they want to perform. But now with those cell phones everywhere, um, they don't get control of how their performance is portrayed through that media. And I think Ko Wen Zhen Bo Taiming is probably like the perfect example of, of this kind of phenomenon. Like if we think about that very controversial Tea Party, um, the TPP hold where where the dancer where which caused them to be um, be blamed for like objectifying women because they hire a group of dancer who wear like very um, sexy clothing, a flight attendant clothing, um, and then welcome Cohen onto the stage. Um, so that was already an issue. But then when there are so many reporters, there are so many cameras around. Um, if you notice all those news reports, all those stories coming out of that tea party, all the cameras were really focusing on the body of the dancers, right? Um, so probably that was not the intention of the Gowinder campaign, but that was the intention of the, the cameraman, whoever is holding that cell phone, whoever has control over that. Um, and that really just, because of that, um, Gowinder got a lot of criticism maybe more than what he should get, but of, of obviously that was already a problematic um, issue. And then um, Karas talk about how younger people, um, like young people very, uh, love Cohen's a lot, but then this making me think about, um, it used to be, um, so it was the age of tw between 20 and 29 that has the most, um, favors him the most. But before um, Cohen's start running for um, the the presidency and also maybe the second turn of his Taipei um, mayor um, term, he was actually loved by the sunflower um, activist who is no longer that young. So who is probably now in the 30 to 39. Um, so I think that's like a demonstration of how Cole's um, persona as a um, political um, figure collapse in some ways because that was really the moment when this shift happened when those whose original support Cole decided to well shift to maybe someone else or just move on with their lives or something like that but then who just enter all these um who just have the right to vote and who also just enter like starting to understand 
politics or everything in Taiwan started to love coal again. And so that makes the new 20 to 29 voters compared to the original 20 to 29 who was now move on to the 30 to 39 um, younger voters. And then Guotai Ming too, right? Um, these two figures are the candidates who have probably occupied the most screen time recently in Taiwan about this presidential election. And for Guotai Ming, he got a lot of criticism whenever he get on screen in some reason, on screen for some reason. In a way, um, political commentaries, uh, com commenters and also a lot of YouTubers, a lot of people who cares about this election criticized him for acting too much, right? He tries so hard to be connected to this new media world. And then every time he tries to do that, something goes wrong. Um, so he's probably also a very good example of thinking about this performativity um, in um, running elections. Um, and I think if I want to go back to like wave makers in this election. I think um, wave maker did a very good job by really revealing all these behind the scene of a presidential election. So it really connects um, the viewers um, with the election by weaving together a narrative that hinges on comprehensive character development, which includes like very simple things like assigning distinct names and identities rather than genetic labels like staff A or someone's someone. So this deliberate choice um, coupled with its portrayal of several important domestic issues serves to underscore a powerful message, right? Um, like politics intricately intersects with every indigenous ex ex um, existence. And uh, irrespective of their role, be it a president, candidate, campaigner, voter, student, or or someone who who ostensibly dis, is disinterested in politics, right? It it really tries the the series really tries to deliver this message that in reality, true political apathy is a myth, right? By illuminating on how the political landscape profoundly impacts. Um, the lives of all its inhabitants and how everyone's personal experience can make waves in the realm of politics. So it really did a good job by tearing off this performativity of that what young young people used to hate politics because they think everyone is acting, they know, make false promise and never really achieve anything or make, never really do anything. But a show like Wave Maker really tries to tear that apart and really wrong and want and let the audience or that the viewers understand that there's really a role for you in there. And it's a role that can make changes in some ways. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, thank you so much. Uh, that was all the questions I had. So I'd like to next open up questions to the audience. Uh, this includes our online audience as well. If you're joining us from YouTube or Facebook, you can go ahead and leave comments. There's already one comment, which I will ask in just a little bit, but I'd like to give a priority to those of us who are here in person. Um, any questions? Uh, I'll take a couple of questions together, if that's okay, because um, there are a number of hands up. So I'll take uh, I'll take two at a time. Let's go with, um, I think the first two hands that are up were from Yuan and from Robert. I'm Yuan, assistant professor in communication at the University of Washington. So I'm very curious about the implications of all this on the focal issue that will really sway voting in Taiwan. So we know traditionally in Taiwan, the critical issue is independence versus unification. But it seems from this discussion, there's a shift in the focus, like Carol was talking about authenticity of uh, the voters, and Ellen, you were talking about, for example, the theatrics, as well as new issues that emerge due to wave makers, like um, gender equality, sexual harassment, uh, and even things like death penalty. So what do you think? Do you think that these new issues that emerge would really have a lasting impact on people's voting choices in the 2024 presidential election? Or do you think that this is just a social media fad uh, that just kind of comes and goes? We all know that uh, in the DNA of social media, these agendas shift really quickly. So one thing can be really hot at a time, but then it shifts to another thing and another thing. So what are your thoughts? Does the focal issue of this election stay at the issue of independence versus unification or are these new things like authenticity, uh, youth voter preferences, and uh, gender relationships, and so on and so forth? Will they come become a sense? Okay. Thank you, Yen. And then Robert in the back. 
Thank you to our speakers and also to the Public Studies Program for having this event. I think it's, it's a really great event. I, I just have a question um, about three of the boogeymen of electoral politics in uh, around the world. And uh, maybe the first two would be for Mars and the second one, or the third one, maybe for uh, populism. I can see that I didn't hear, maybe I, I wasn't getting you know, decoding what was happening with some of the politicians, particularly those that um, were uh, kind of that Hartz didn't want to talk about. So, <laughs> <laughs> second is a polarization. And, you know, it strikes me as unusual to have kind of two quite viable um, third and fourth party candidates. If the situation was as polarized as I kind of thought that panel was polarized, so, so I'd like to hear more about what's going on with polarization and how that might be reflected in the presidential election. The third is disinformation. So uh, China is, seems like an actor that's very invested in what's happening in Taiwanese electoral politics, and this is something that maybe goes across all three uh, of the speakers. But what's happening in the disinformation space? Um, well, since I, I think I have a, a fairly quick answer to, to Robert's question, um, on populism, I, there's, um, there's, I think, a debate in the Taiwan Watchers community about whether uh, uh, Ke Wenja is populist. Um, he's clearly a kind of anti-status anti quo candidate. He's positioned himself as uh, being something new in opposition to the two longstanding uh, main parties. Um, but there's elements also of his rhetoric that's actually quite elitist. Like uh, he emphasizes that he's a doctor over and over and over <laughs> again. And that gives him, uh, that makes him the smartest person in the room. That means uh, he can make decisions. Uh, he just sees problems and decides them. He doesn't need to go to the people and find out what they're feeling or what what challenges they're facing. He can figure it out himself. And so there's there's actually an element of his persona that I think is almost anti, it's elitist, it's anti-populist. Um, and so that's an interesting debate to have. Go, I think, is more populist. He's more in that mold, but he's also not doing well in the polls. So I, I don't think there's a huge amount of uh, kind of uh, a huge market for what he's offering. Uh, to the extent we talk about populism in Taiwan, I I think 2020 was kind of the peak of it with Han Guoyu, who was uh, eventually became the KMT nominee. Han Guoyu used very populist rhetoric in his uh, campaign. He would talk about the Shumin, the, so the, the kind of common people, and he, he basically created a new term for the common people versus the elites. And, um, you know, this term may be with us for a while, but it's it's actually a pretty interesting coining of the people. That's not in three principles of the people. It's not in any of the PRC's rhetoric. Um, it's it's kind of the common lumpen proletariat almost. Um, and uh, his appeal was that you people have been screwed over by the elites, the corrupt elites. And, uh, you know, I'm an outsider. I'm just an innocent, you know, kind of simple guy, but um, I can solve all the problems uh, because I'm pure at heart. And there was no kind of conversation about specific policy issues or uh, anything like that. And so I, I, I was actually, because I think populism is a real danger to democracy, if it gets out of hand, I was actually pretty glad to see that his campaign was pretty re decisively rejected by the electorate. And then he was uh, recalled from office. And so I feel like the kind of populist wave, if there was one in Taiwan, crested uh, almost four years ago. On polarization, uh, I think the idea that Taiwan is a deeply polarized society and politics is is outdated, uh, and that there's actually been a convergence of the two main parties on, their, as David was noting, on cross-strait relations, on the relationship with the US. I just note that Tsai Ing-wen often talks now about the Republic of China, Taiwan, and embraces the whole kind of Republic of China constitutional framework. She's not trying to eliminate that or get rid of it. Um, and the KMT uh, has kind of moved mostly because of electoral pressure towards the center as well, where they're uh, critical of Beijing, critical of one country, two systems. Um, and their positions on a lot of issues don't look 
really very different at all to me. And so that's part of what's, I think, opening up space for people uh, talking about issues that are on maybe orthogonal to that green blue cross strait cleavage. Well, on, on most of these questions, I'd really defer to the experts on Taiwan here. But I think to the extent that cross strait relations isn't the core issue in the elections, that's what makes this a unique election to, for James' original question, that, that um, this is really a time when we're talking about domestic politics in a way that, that has not been sort of obscured or otherwise dominated by, uh, by cross straits issues. I, uh, you know, as to disinformation that, that you know, in the, the local elections before 2020, there was seen to have been quite effective disinformation by the PRC that, that helped uh, various candidates uh, and allowed Han Guoyu to, to win in Kaohsiung and, and other kinds of things. And Taiwan has been addressing it ever since. And you can you know, Washington DC think tanks are putting on programs, it seems like every two weeks about dealing with PRC disinformation. Uh, presumably the, P the Taiwan is mobilized to, to try and confront this, but I'll defer to others in this room about how effective that's been. So um, I'll try to answer Xiaorin's question, and hopefully we will cover a little bit of Robert's as well. Um, I don't think there's really a shift, although we did all focus on some different topics and this like very big topic between like or issue between Taiwan and China. Um, like if we go back to WaveMaker, it was criticized for not including any mention of Taiwan's relation with China, right? While it deals with a lot of other domestic issues, which are the ones that maybe younger peoples or um, like younger voters care more than, um, than just that overwhelming question that dom seems to dominate everything, right? But I don't think there's really a shift because it's always there and it's every day. It's really hard to just totally get rid of it. It's really all about, um, like who you're speaking to, right? Um, so as I mentioned, like when we get to a global audience or um, when we're trying to talk about Taiwan's election on a global level, the topic of Taiwan's relation with China is always the only question that people cares about. But then when we switch to thinking about this more internally, that question is there, everyone knows about it, but then what else? Right. So we started to talk about other things that really um, represent Taiwan as a democratic society that can talk and discuss all of these different issues um, involving different communities um, instead of only thinking about this one big enemy in some ways. We have a lot of other things that we need to take care of to do housekeeping. So I don't really see, see that as a shift. And I think I, it, it might be also helpful to borrow this interview, um, the screenwriter of um, making wave makers, sorry, almost borrow our topic back, um, who um, during which they share their perspective on wave makers. So um, one of the screenwriter, Jian Li Yin, said that um, this series is her love letter um, to the Sunflower Generation of 2014 while the other screenwriter disagrees and consider the show more as a homage to all political parties, staffers, campaign workers, and political contributors. So clearly it was their collective intention to write a script that returns the story to all the hardworking individual behind Taiwan's probably democratic scenes. And that's probably why there's this drop off of this big issue between Taiwan and China. And their positionalities um, during the screenwriting process highlight how Taiwan's political um, environment serves as a fertile ground for a show like Wavemaker. Right? So the Sunflower Movement in particular um, mark a pivotal moment, ushering um, in a new wave um, of young activists, um, the younger generations, shaping Taiwan's political landscape and making waves in their own terms. And so there's probably that moment where all of these more 
if you want to say more internal, more domestic issues come into play. Um, so these two screenwriters, both being part of this young uh, sunflower generation, they drew from their um, personal involvement in these movement and also their participation in elections campaign. And all of those experiences really brought them to depict um, political process with a depth and also with social, uh, with human connections. And that that mutual influence between wave makers and Taiwan's political culture is evident as, um, as the show through its narrative, um, not only reflects the realities of Taiwan's politics, but Elbed being more of this on this entertaining side, but also foster, hopefully, would foster a more engaged and informed electorate. Thank you. Um, previously, we had two hands up that I, I had glossed over. So um, the next up was was Nick, who wanted to actually Nick is our our disinformation expert. So you can also chime in on this, <laughs> this past question and also Jeff. So I'll take those two next and then I'll open it up to further questions after those two. I'll, I'll try to be brief on this information. Uh, we just released a report from a team at Microsoft, uh, the lead researcher on the East Asia team, and they focus on cross strait disinformation. Uh, so wanted to be a left love the program. Um, but the main things we've seen since 2019 are just a vast scaling up of over online information, information operations, specifically, uh, you know, traditional bots and kind of troll accounts and stuff like that. Uh, but also more sophisticated stuff like co-opting influencers, particularly in the context of Taiwan. So um, that's a thing that you yeah, can check out the new report that came out. I think it's called Digital Drugs Across East Asia. Happy to send them through. Um, but we kind of talked about the main stuff. But it's sort of been a gradient since 2019. Um, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, Human Rights Act, and the US Congress, and kind of genocide declarations around the world. Um, and then Pelosi being the pretty kind of it's basically a step function of the scale of these operations. It's time for some, so certainly something we're thinking a lot about and um, something to think about um, very intensely every four years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, my question is definitely a tiny kind of question. I'm not a political scientist, but I'm just curious. Um, it's necessarily speculative. Uh, but Koanja as a person, just I never know how to square in a circle. Um, <laughs> so I'm curious, just as political evolution, there's been, there have been many people in the past, you know, Choi or Zhang Longchong, any kind of people who were previously deep green and have involved being the you Shinta, know, the furthest, not even blue, they may be even perhaps red. Um, Kowenja is kind of uh, progressing along that line, I guess, but he's also just his own thing. He had comments over the summer about that he would uh, paralyze the attack. China with cyber attacks, ATMs, and their transition. So, I will cut myself off now, but I just, his political <laughs> evolution, what motivates this guy? Is there an ideology there? Is in power? Is he a populist? I hope you don't have questions, but you all have uh, much deeper research on this than I do, so I'm interested in hearing your thoughts. Jeff. Uh, yeah, uh, I just uh, wonder if any one of you could comment on uh, the accuracy of the poll. <laughs> <laughs> and how it has been maybe then not just in this interaction but in the last few cycles and what it has been uh, indicator uh, and then uh, and then also how it, uh, if uh, the cooperation between the blue camp and the white camp can be as simple as a mathematical addition of 20 percent plus one mm -hmm. First, you want to take the first shot? <laughs> sure. There's a lot on the table. <laughs> so, um, so I just I wanted to actually make a point about disinformation as well in the Taiwan context. It's uh, logically we would think the CCP is better at using disinformation against Taiwan than any other target in the world because they use a common language. It's a culture they're familiar with. They study it intensively. And so they, if they're gonna succeed anywhere at kind of affecting political behavior through disinfo, it should be in Taiwan, right? And that was our, our kind of common assumption in the 2018 and 2020 elections. And then Han Guoyu just got blown out of the water in the 2020 election. and. 
my takeaway from that result was that Taiwan voters aren't stupid, right? Uh, and there's actually a deep kind of partisan identification that drives how they interpret uh, information coming in from disreputable sources. Uh, and so you actually saw a lot of people on the blue end of the spectrum being very susceptible to disinformation about Han Guoyu and the Green Camp, but they were already going to vote for Han Guoyu anyway. And everybody else saw that rhetoric as, and in some cases it wasn't disinformation, it was actually true or the, the DPP had kind of, you know, uh, accused the KMT of cooperating with China or accused the CCP of trying to uh, influence things. And it was actually organically uh, driven by Taiwanese themselves, but the DPP was able to use that to mobilize their own base. And so uh, the overall result, uh, the effect on the election was not what China wanted. Uh, and so the bigger question I have about disinformation is we can see a lot of inputs in, in certain cases and, and spikes every four years. But the, the question about whether it's actually effective in changing political behavior and influencing electoral outcomes, I think, is a it's a much harder case to make. And in the Taiwan case so far, I haven't actually seen good evidence that the CCP knows what they're doing at all. Uh, and in fact, they do best generally when they do the least they shut up and they just, you know, they, our hands are not in this at all. And that creates space then for people to make more kind of authentic critiques of the DPP. Um, Ke Wenge's political evolution. What a guy. Um, um, yeah, he's a pretty unique figure in not just in Taiwan politics, but kind of in democratic politics. So he's uh, this is being recorded, so I'll try to be very polite, but I mean, he is, he has, it's not a, a secret that he's kind of on the spectrum, right? So he's, uh, as a politician, it's incredible, but the guy does not have good people skills at all, right? So he has to be coached when he's in a room to like, look at the person who's talking to him. Uh, he has to be coached to smile when people are taking pictures. He has to be coached, oh, you should shake hands with this person. This person is greeting you and is important, right? There's a lot of stuff that is just not natural to him at all. Uh, and so it's it's bizarre when people don't know anything about him and meet him for the first time. And you're the mayor of Taipei and you stood over there in the corner for half an hour just kind of staring at your feet or looking at your note cards rather than greeting all the people in the room. Like that's completely anti-social, anti you know, kind of politician behavior. Uh, but it's the contradiction at the heart of him is that that's what a lot of people like. He's authentic. He doesn't, you know, he's not smarmy and oily and out there, you know, trying to work the crowd in that way. And um, to a certain subset of voters, that's preferable to anything else on offer. Um, so uh, in terms of evolution, I mean, he's still He's gotten better at, at the kind of public aspects of the job. When we saw him at Stanford, um, I thought he had improved significantly from when I saw him in 2015, for instance. Um, so he has been coached or, or has kind of, you know, uh, gotten used to this part of the part of the job, but I don't think he will ever be smooth at it. Uh, and in fact, that's part of his brand. If he were smooth, people would stop trusting him. Oh man, uh, yeah, uh, I'm not an expert on American politics, so I don't get along. <laughs> uh, no, I, actually, I have a follow on question to Jeff's, and that is in the, the polls, there was 20% undecided. So, what, what's the how does that break out before this, too? Yeah, so um, let me say a little bit about accuracy of the polls. Um, in 2020, the last presidential election we had, in the end, they turned out to be pretty accurate. Um, and some people who were real deep Han Guoyu supporters were stunned by that because one of the many kind of forms of disinformation during that campaign was that the polls were rigged. Uh, I heard this explicitly from people that I know well. The DPP government controls the telephone uh, kind of raw or the telephone list of telephone numbers that the polling system samples from, and they were adding in DPP telephone numbers, so it looked like Han was further behind than he was. There was, and this was being repeated on Pan Blue Media in some places. Um, and uh, in the end, what the polls predicted was a, a 
stunning, uh, you know, large signing one win between 15 and 20 points. And I was actually out in public a week before basically saying that's what the polls point to. Unless there's something really off, that's what's going to happen. And it happened. Uh, and so uh, I actually think the, the average of the polls is, gives you a decent idea of where the electorate is headed. Um, Taiwan has a huge number of polls now. They're done almost every day. They're done by a lot of different companies. And so there are, like in the U.S., there are clear house effects, greenhouse effects and blue house effects. But when you adjust for those, you know, a biased estimate is still an informative estimate if it's consistent. And so you can kind of correct for that. Um, so I still think there's the polls do tell us a lot. Um, and you should weight the polls that are really transparent about their methodology and that do polls regularly. So even if it's a biased estimate, uh, if you see significant shifts up or down, that tells you something as long as they're doing the polling the same way. It's telling you there's shifts in a pu public opinion. Uh, and so there's kind of an art to putting all this together and you get a, a, a better instinct for it the more you do it. But I think the polls in Taiwan do tell us something valid about what's going to happen. Oh, 20%. Sorry. Hey. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, I think the bigger question is who turns out in this election. So um, one reason I'm kind of bearish on Ko Wenja is uh, he's got his supporters tend to be young uh, and younger voters uh, like in the U.S., younger voters in Taiwan turn out at lower rates. They're also more fickle. They don't have strong partisan identification with one party or another. Uh, and so I could see a lot of them abandoning Ko and going somewhere else uh, or not voting at all. Whereas the older voters, the 60 and up, that's solid. That's gold if you've got that in your camp because they will turn out no matter what. Uh, they're very loyal generally. Uh, and so uh, I would have to dig into the undecided 20%. If it's all young voters, um, it, it could be decisive, but they could all just stay home and play video games. That day or something. <laughs> so. um, as a media studies, person on this panel. Well, accuracy of the poll is, uh, of course, very important. But for, for me, the reading or the framing of those polls is more interesting and also attracting, especially if you're watch, if you are a follower of, as say, political commentary shows, the way they frame them is just fascinating. And then not even think about the accuracy of those polls, but just by how they try to utilize those poll results to 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 frame either their support or criticism of the, of the candidates is really a fascinating um, part of watching those shows. If if that's something of your interest, and I think also there is this um, about this disinformation. I think there's also this generation gap, generational gap. Um, like younger folks, from my personal experience. Well, kind of, we're trained to be skeptical in some ways, right? So we we kind of just question everything, especially when it comes to Taiwan, U.S., Taiwan, China relations. All of these, we're skeptical from from day one in some way. But then when it comes to the young uh, older generation, there's a very different dynamic in there, right? Especially when they come into social media and how they engage with these different group chats. All of those are a very different landscape compared to what the younger voters are are seeing. Right? Um, and then if we want to talk about Ke Wente, um, it's really, again, all about the persona he's trying to, to perform or portray um, in different occasions, right? And I think, again, this Bloomberg interview with him is very useful to think about Ke Wente as a candidate, um, as a political figure. Um, so there's... I think there are two, I remember there are two Bloomberg interview with Ko Wenzhe, and one is like an obviously rehearsed and script version. Um, so it's, everything is very official and he stay on the script. So he was a perfect interlocutor at that moment. But there's also another um, interview that happened on the train where he just casually talking to, to the reporter from Bloomberg. And that shows a totally different um, Cohen to compared to that rehearsed interview. So I would totally encourage you to 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 watch that to maybe help you understand better of Cohen to his track of being a political figure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I can attest to the the kind of generational difference as well. I I serve as the personal fact checker for my mother. She <laughs> <laughs> 
that line articles that she's trying to do for my mom. <laughs> yeah, I think it's not uncommon. Um, okay, uh, we only have about four minutes left. I'd like to take maybe three questions together, and then uh, I'll also take two questions from online. Um, so let me see who wants to put in the questions. Okay, one, and then, well, uh, why don't you ask your question first, and I'll get a couple others. Sure. I'll turn it back to Philip Nang, I'm a student at Texas. I want to ask a little bit more about the view from John Lanark, because mm -hmm. in past elections, um, you know, China has usually communicated with the Taiwanese public ahead of past elections, you know, whether in terms of threats or incentives or sometimes even doctrinal change. And, you know, there's been speculation for the last for the last couple of years now that Juan Bonilla and other ideological leaders are looking to reformulate one country, two systems. Have you seen that in the works in this election? I guess a shorter way to ask it is for such a consequential election, it seems like China has been awfully quiet, maybe too quiet. I'm curious as to your thoughts. One more question. Um, uh, yeah. uh, one, I think this question is maybe for uh, Chang. Like, so forgive me if I'm not as educated on the subject, but like in a lot of like Taiwanese film and cultural things, like with the but like if you go back to like the 90s when the non election law was lifted, you saw, for instance, a lot of the tension express itself through things like the, I guess I can't see, like in the revival of indigenous sort of culture in sort of media works. And I'm wondering with the sort of uh, polarization and things like that, with all the tensions that are going on for you today in Taiwan, do you, in your studies of Taiwanese culture and media, do you notice the rise of any new themes that are developing as a result to these new situations? Uh, and I'll ask two questions from online. Uh, these are both good questions. One is, if the KMT-TPP alliance, so assuming it comes together and assuming it wins, how would they engage with China? Are imports from TSMC for the U.S. at risk in that environment? Uh, and then the final question, I think this is a great question to end on. If there isn't that much of a difference in terms of cross-strait relations across the candidates, what are some of the other key issues that set them apart? As a voter, how should we cast our vote? I like that question. So, uh, actually, I want to say a little bit about Beijing's view of this election. Um, I've wondered this as well, and I've had the opportunity to speak to some people in mainland China who watch Taiwan closely, and I've been a little surprised at just uh, how traditional their view is on this election. They want the KMT to win, full stop. Uh, and they would prefer the KMT over any other alternative out there. Um, and it just, it would make their lives easier um, if they had a KMT partner to work with. They're, they say valiantly that they're not afraid of a lie win and they're prepared to deal with that. Um, there's some thinking, I think uh, perhaps too optimistically that if Lai wins, we'd be back in the late Chen Shui-bian era, and the U.S. and Beijing would have an opportunity to co-manage Taiwan um, because Lai is so clearly out of line with U.S. interests. Um, but generally, I think they're, um, in part, they're being quiet uh, as well because of being burned by all of their past attempts to try to intervene in the election. And... Um, so the signal they're sending is, you know, vote KMT and we'll cooperate with that. But um, I think they're they're being smart and not trying to insert themselves into the middle of the election. And if cross-strait relations aren't really kind of driving voting behavior, that's probably better for Beijing. Um, uh, TPP KMT alliance. Um, I think it's an open question, actually, how much they would engage with China. It's it kind of depends on which one is on the top. Um, uh, Ho Yo Yi, and in fact, anybody around Ho and the KMT who talks about cross strait relations says, "We'll just go back to 2008. We'll endorse the 1992 consensus. Those are the magic words that will open up the door to Beijing, and we'll we'll be back in that happy place." Um, and that's it, right? There's there's nothing more that follows from that, and I'm. I'm not sure that that's all Beijing will want uh, in that scenario. And I'm not sure that the KMT is willing or able to give more than that. And so uh, if there's a KMT president next, uh, we'll find out, but I'm a little skeptical. Um, I don't think, uh, and pretty definitively, I don't think the KMT, if they win, are going to be so pro-China that they 
uh, try to distance themselves from the U.S. and kind of do a, a you know a reverse squeeze where they're cutting off supplies of chips to the U.S. I think that's beyond the pale for any Taiwan leader at this point. I mean, too quiet is relative, I think. Uh, I mean, I suspect you're going to see more and more airplanes crossing the midline as we get close to the election and more circumnavigation of naval craft around Taiwan and so on, so that the pressure is going to be there. Um, you know, I. the question is this sort of black box of what is Chinese politics and who can speak truth to Xi Jinping? And the answer is, I think, no one. Uh, and so he's still convinced one country, two systems is working. Meanwhile, the people in Taiwan are monitoring carefully what's going on in Hong Kong, uh, and they know that it's a non-starter. Uh, and yet, without Xi saying, you can be more creative about this, um, there, there's, there's not going to be the kind of rethinking of one country, two systems as if there was a possible rethinking uh, that could somehow answer the question. I, I would say um, two other things before I stop. One is um, that uh, with the sudden death of Li Keqiang, uh, the former premier uh, who was younger than Xi Jinping, uh, that she now has to be thinking much more seriously, perhaps, than he had been about his own mortality and his legacy and who succeeds him. And part of his legacy, he wants to be unification. So does this speed up a timetable? Does it make him more demanding or not? I could make an argument, but I don't have any basis for making that argument, or you know, it, it seems logically to follow. Uh, but that would be, uh, you know, something that I think is going to be maybe a wild card in PRC policy going forward. The other point is to give a plug to my colleagues in Japan studies that they're having a program tonight at seven about Japan's <laughs> uh, new security policy. So if you're interested in that, go to. Um, Walker Ames and Kane Hall and get the lowdown there and don't go on the brief remarks I made here uh, tonight. Um, well, to answer the question of whether I'm seeing any trend or transition in not only just television, but also maybe films, um, I think they're on a very similar track in some ways that, um, again, we have to think about the audience. Like, who you're talking to, where where the films or the workers screen to, who the who they're screened to, right? So after the martial law era, um, Taiwan has this famous new Taiwan cinema, and where they delve into a lot of those history that was usually um, initially taboo to talk about. But then at that moment, it was also the time when Taiwan is in this very tricky position, losing its position in UN and in a lot of things. So. Cinema of Taiwan at that time was really framed to promote Taiwan in a very particular way, right? So we have, like, you know, as everyone would say, it's like a free China and a lot of things like that. So we get to talk about those issues where the other side of the ocean cannot talk about. But then um, after that, it's a very similar move as we're seeing in Wavemaker, right? Um, recent productions, cinematic production especially, they, they started to shift towards more domestic issues instead of thinking about this grand historiography of Taiwan or these all these taboos that we cannot talk about. But there's always this very um, like shared trait in all these Taiwan's production that is the focus on the Xiao Ren Wu, which is the commoner, right? It's just how they are framed. So when we go back to the the nineteen eighties, thinking about the new cinema, these Xiao Ren Wu, these commoners are usually framed in a way that they speak in an allegorical level in some ways. Um, but then now, when we look at recent productions from Taiwan, these commoners are are portrayed. Their stories are portrayed in a more personal levels, right? Speaking more to um, the local Taiwanese viewers compared to maybe everyone else, right? Um, so 
again, we have to think about the audience. And if we're thinking about the audience, I think Netflix is a good example to think about this, right? Netflix hasn't produced much or collaborated on much Taiwanese production, but when they do, I think they started with this one called Zui Mong Zhe. Sorry, I forgot the English title. And that mini series started as something very similar aesthetically, visually, all, everything narratively, very similar to the new cinema. I think that's what the international audience expected out of Thai, some the production out of Taiwan. But then when they move on, they started to move on to other col um, collaboration. Eventually, now on the wave makers, obviously they are also switching. Um, the way they promote or the way they package um, productions from Taiwan. So we're seeing a very different um, production um, from Wavemaker. Again, speaking while very distinctly to distinct topics in Taiwan, but also at the same time, very universal to the international audience. So I think that's the shift over there. Um, but in terms of how to cast vote, I don't... It's not like I don't have an answer, but I, I don't. <laughs> but um, but I think since we're on this promotion kind of track, there is a documentary on Taiwan <laughs> on November seven that's screening on campus. It's called Invisible, um, Invisible Nation, and which will be maybe a good way to reconsider or think about um how to cast that vote. Um, <laughs> And also, um, I think Taiwan's presidential election in its current state evoke, again, from a media studies point of view, evoke memories of those Formosa television. I'm not sure if you know, if you are familiar with that. It's the Min Shi um, drama that spent over 100 or 200 episodes, where each new installment is only filmed just a couple of episodes um, ahead so that the screenwriters can um, can rely on feedback or collect um responses from BBS, I know you're probably too young to know what that is, um, or letters um, to the editors to shape the ending. So for me, much like an eager and eager viewers um, waiting for those 8 p.m. drama, I'm certainly intrigued to see how everything continues to unfold in Taiwan's election. I'll just add for the person online, um, you know, vote your heart's desire. Taiwan has <laughs> It's fought hard for its democracy, so it's something to cherish, and the right to vote is is something that that was not easily won. Um, thank you so much for coming tonight. We're now over time. Uh, I just want to drop mention again of the the Japan Studies events that will be happening at seven. I understand this speaker is very close to the Prime Minister, so this is a, a very important event for the Japan Studies program. And then to highlight once again, Invisible Nation, which will be shown next Tuesday. Uh, you can register for those tickets; they are free, and the director will be here, so you can ask her questions and maybe ask her the same questions that we asked of Karis, Ellen, and David. So thank you so much, Karis, Ellen, and David. I just want to give you one more round of applause. And thank you for coming tonight.